Hey, I'm Rob Woodger from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to cloud operations in Domain 5 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the first of three videos for Domain 5. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are an infinitesimal part of our complete CCSP masterclass. Cloud operations, cloud ops, refers to the management, maintenance, and optimization of cloud-based infrastructure, applications, and services. Cloud operation involves activities like monitoring, performance management, security management, compliance, and resource optimization to ensure smooth, fast, efficient, and reliable cloud environments. Cloud ops enables organizations to scale and manage resources effectively, maintain availability, and improve overall system resilience helping organizations to optimize the benefits of cloud investment. All important stuff, obviously, so let's dig into it. First up, let's talk about how you can access systems in the cloud. Local access methods like KVM, keyboard, video, mouse, and console access provide direct physical level interaction with cloud devices, often used for initial setup or troubleshooting issues when network-based access is unavailable. So these local access methods grant full control over the system, even during boot processes or when network services are down, making these local accesses uh, essential for deeper level management. KVM, remember keyboard, video, mouse, provides direct hardware level access to a device through the keyboard, video, and mouse, allowing you to control the keyboard via uh, view the video output and use the mouse as if you were physically present at the machine. This is particularly useful for full control, including during boot processes, updating the BIOS configuration or when operating the system is unresponsive. Console access usually operates at the command line level and connects directly to the system's console interface, something like the COM port. Console access is typically text-based and can provide access even if the network configuration is not yet set up or if the operating system has limited functionality. Console access is commonly used for troubleshooting, system boot diagnostics, and other setup tasks. Okay, now remote access methods, such as SSH, Secure Shell for Linux, and RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol for Windows, enable users, enable us to access to securely connect to cloud devices over the network. Remote methods are efficient for ongoing operations, while local access is typically reserved for situations requiring direct unrestricted device interaction. SSH is a secure command line protocol mainly used to access Linux or Unix-based systems remotely. It enables encrypted communication over the network, allowing you to execute commands, transfer files, and manage the configurations of the target machines. RDP is a graphical remote access protocol primarily used for Windows systems, allowing you to connect to a device's full desktop interface remotely. It provides a visual environment where you can interact with applications, files, the system, setting through the GUI, the graphical user interface, as if you were sitting in front of the physical machine. Hardware configuration in the cloud involves managing settings related to physical level components, configuring the hardware. So let's go through a couple major examples of hardware that needs to be properly configured. The BIOS, basic input output system, is firmware stored on a small amount of memory chip on the motherboard. The BIOS initializes the hardware when the system is turned on. In the cloud, the BIOS can be used to control things like boot order, enable virtualization extensions, enable secure boot, or configure power management. So it's still important to be able to manage the BIOS in the cloud. A TPM, we've talked about these before, right? A trusted platform module is a chip built into an endpoint, like a laptop or a server. TPMs are used to securely store encryption keys, ensure secure boot, and protect sensitive information on an endpoint device. And these need to be configured properly at a hardware level. An HSM, a hardware security module, is a physical device built to securely store and manage encryption keys at the organization level, not for a specific device. And HSMs are, remember, dedicated hardware devices for managing cryptographic keys. And again, HSMs absolutely need to be properly configured at a hardware level. Hardening is the process of securing a system by reducing its attack surface area and minimizing vulnerabilities. Hardening is a critical process that must be done to any new device, system, application, operating system, anything. 
When we buy something new, it is intentionally not delivered all locked down and secure. We need to be able to log into something for the very first time and configure it to the specific needs of our environment. So hardening is the critical process of locking anything down and ensuring it remains appropriately locked down in production. But locked down according to what? Typically, a baseline. Security baselines are mandatory configuration settings that aim to ensure that a system has a secure foundation of controls. Baselines are essentially just a checklist of things that you need to go through to lock something down, to harden it. Disabling unnecessary services, disabling or removing guest accounts, installing all the necessary patches. These are all examples of how you would harden something. A baseline should be created for each system and tailored to a system's specific usage within the environment. Availability is, of course, having our information accessible to authorized parties when they need it. And that's obviously very important. So let's talk about just a couple of techniques that we can use to help us achieve greater availability. One option for architecting highly available systems is to use clustering. This is essentially involves having multiple systems sharing a workload. So for example, a cluster of say 10 web servers sitting behind a load balancer. If one of the members, one of the systems goes down, there are still nine other members of the cluster running to provide availability. Redundancy is different. Redundancy involves having a single primary system and one or more secondary systems to switch over to in case of failures. Unlike with clustering, the redundant secondary systems aren't doing any work when the primary system is online. Another critical requirement of cloud operations is being able to monitor and control a whole range of systems across the cloud. Let's start with how we can monitor and control VMs, virtual machines. One way is through a guest OS virtualization tool set. And this is a software agent installed on the operating system of a VM. And this guest OS virtualization tool set can report on the performance and other metrics of the VM it's installed on. And it can also be used to push configuration changes to the VM. So the guest OS tool set is a software tool agent that's installed on the VM. VM introspection is very different. VM introspection allows for monitoring and analyzing the state of a VM from outside the VM itself. This is usually done by the hypervisor. This approach enables the detection of malware, unauthorized changes, or abnormal behaviors without relying on software being installed in the VM, making this type of monitoring less vulnerable to tampering by attackers. VM introspection from the hypervisor can inspect memory, file systems, and process activities, making it a powerful tool for securely monitoring a system for performing forensics and compliance management. So that's VM introspection. There are a range of things that we want to monitor from a performance perspective to ensure optimal performance. These include things like CPU usage, memory usage, disk and network bandwidth. Um, and the cloud provider must ensure that all these different things are monitored across their entire fleet of devices and services that are provided to customers. Network monitoring in the cloud is essential to ensure security performance and availability of overall cloud resources. By tracking traffic patterns, latency, bandwidth usage, and potential anomalies, organizations can detect and respond to threats like DDoS attacks, unauthorized access, and data breaches. Monitoring helps to optimize resource usage, prevent outages, and maintain compliance. So it's important, obviously, to monitor the network. A useful protocol for network monitoring is SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. SNMP can be used to monitor, manage, and configure network devices, such as routers, switches, servers, and workstations. SNMP allows administrators to collect real-time data on network performance, detect issues, and receive alerts for specific events. SNMP can provide insights into device status, resource utilization, error rates, traffic flow, and this all allows for effective troubleshooting and proactive network maintenance. Let's now move on to a couple of common techniques used for application performance monitoring. Real user monitoring, RUM, involves monitoring real users using your system. You can monitor their usage, how long pages are taking to load, any common errors that they might be getting, and then you can address these problems that real users are encountering. So that's RUM, real user monitoring. 
Synthetic performance monitoring involves building agents that simulate user actions. Instead of monitoring real users, what you're instead doing here is you're creating agents to test the functionality, availability, and response times of the app. All right, and the last thing we'll talk about monitoring is hardware. Cloud providers closely monitor a variety of hardware components to ensure reliability, prevent failures, handle hardware failures, and to do maintenance and ensure high performance across the entire cloud. So let me give you some examples of what's monitoring. Monitored. Various temperatures on devices are carefully tracked to prevent overheating, with fan speeds dynamically adjusted in response to temperature changes for efficient cooling. Power supply units are monitored to detect issues and ensure energy efficiency. Disk health, hard drive health is essential with metrics like usage, read write speeds, error rates, and drive temperature constantly analyzed to predict and avoid storage failures. CPU and memory usage are tracked to balance workloads and to prevent resource shortages. This helps to ensure performance for all the various customers. Network interface cards are monitored for health, speed, and error rates to maintain reliably connections. Battery backups are monitored through parts of the uninterruptible power supply system. This is checked for health and charge levels. So there's lots of different stuff, lots of different hardware that is very carefully monitored in the cloud. Okay, now moving on to the next major topic, DRS. Distributed resource scheduling is an approach for balancing the available resources against demand from various customers. If a cloud provider experiences demand spikes that are difficult for it to handle, it needs mechanisms in place for sharing resources amongst customers. So let's go through some different methods that can be used here as part of DRS. Reservations are where customers have agreements for a minimum amount of resources that they will be allocated. As an example, they might have an agreement with their provider that they are guaranteed eight gigs of RAM for a specific VM. Reservations can be set for compute, network, and storage. And remember, a reservation is essentially a guaranteed minimum. A limit is the maximum amount of resources that a customer will be allocated for the billing period. Limits can be useful if you don't want to run into an enormous cloud bill from unexpected or unauthorized usage of cloud resources. If you set a limit and you exceed it, your provider will stop providing you with resources. Limits are essentially defined maximums. Shares define the relative priority of resource access when multiple VMs or applications compete for the same resources. Higher shares increase priority, allowing an application to access more resources in contention situations. Shares only matter if there's a resource contention issue, and shares essentially define who gets priority in the event of a resource contention issue. Dynamic optimization automatically adjusts resource allocation based on real-time demand and usage patterns. This helps maximize efficiency by reallocating underutilized resources and responding to workload changes without manual intervention. It also helps to ensure the customer's reservations are met. Remember, a reservation is a minimum. For example, if a compute node is running low on resources, it can be potentially live migrated to a different compute node that has more resources available. So dynamic optimization is an obviously an important technique for rapid elasticity and scalability of cloud services. Okay, moving on. Backups and restoration are another essential operation in the cloud to protect data against loss, corruption, and accidental deletion. With cloud environments often hosting critical applications and data, having reliable backups ensure that customers can recover important information in case of hardware failure, cyber attacks, or human error. Restoration processes allow for quick data retrieval and service continuity, minimizing downtime and potential revenue loss. So regular backups also support compliance with data protection policies and regulations. Put simply, backups and restoration are crucial for maintaining data integrity, availability, and reliability in the cloud. There is a lot of stuff that we have to think about backing up in the cloud. But we're just going to focus on VMs here. It is, of course, important to back up the data stored in your VMs. But we also need to back up our OS and VM configuration. Uh, let me explain. If you need to recover a virtual machine, then you need to have a backup of the VM's virtual hardware configuration 
and the configuration of the operating system. Because if you want to restore a VM, you need to know what virtual hardware it was running on top of. So it's important to ensure that all this data is backed up. Now let's talk about a couple of the methods that we can use for backing up the data on VMs. Agent-based backups involve installing an agent on every VM. The agent installed on a VM can ensure the data is backed up as required. Agent-less is another approach. As the name suggests, agent-less backups don't involve any agents software installed on the VM. Instead, there's a utility that remotely logs into a system, backs up the file, and then logs out again. So that's agent-less. And the final backup method we'll talk about here, and the final item, in fact, in this mind map, snapshots. Snapshots capture the exact state and data of a VM at a specific point in time, including any data on its hard drive, its, its volume, memory, and even settings. Essentially, every bit of data related to a VM can be captured in a snapshot. Snapshots provide a quick and reliable way to backup VMs, enabling easy rollbacks to a previous state if needed, such as after a failed update, system crash, or data corruption. And snapshots are especially useful for testing development and forensics and recovery purposes. So just remember a snapshot is basically a moment in time capture of a running VM and all the data related to it. And there you go. That's an overview of cloud operations within Domain 5, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam.